Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I like that, Joe. Thank you. I want to share just one, one quick thought. It's from Matthew 1, 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are given the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Brothers and sisters, we should really just feast on that thought. So true as we enter this season of appreciation of Emmanuel, God with us, coming to earth. But he did it for a purpose, he did it for a reason, and it's to save your soul from the wrath of God. That's what he did. It's a very, very important point for us to, to remember. So Father in heaven, we thank you. Lord, for sending the Lord Jesus. Lord, we approach you as your children this morning with hearts of praise and appreciation, Lord, that we do say praise the Lord, hallelujah, in our hearts this morning for coming to do what we could not do, to do ourselves, Lord. It is a mystery and it is a mercy, Lord, that you would even come and save mankind. But Lord, because of your character and your nature, Lord, you decided to do what we could not do for ourselves. So we praise your holy name. Lord, we thank you for this mercy from heaven, Lord. And you did come to save your children, Lord, from the wrath that will come upon this earth. Lord, your word says this clearly in so many places. So I pray, Lord, that our hearts are drawn to the truth of your word. Lord, and in that truth, Lord, we are prepared this morning to hear that word of truth come from our pastor. Lord, and I pray that that truth as it comes forth, Lord, would pierce our hearts, would pierce our souls in such a way, Lord, that we would be changed. So, Lord, help us to see ourselves aright. Lord, help us to see you aright. Help us, Lord, as that word comes, Lord, to humbly receive that word and have it implanted in us, Lord, in such a way that it would affect our lives. That the glory of the gospel would do such a mighty work in us, Lord. It would continue to change us from darkness to light. Lord, that the relationship between us and our Father in heaven is continually strengthened. And Lord, the relationships that we have with each other would be built in love. So Lord, help your people, help this body here to hear your word of truth. Lord, change us for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, brothers and sisters, I'll be reading to you some verses from Isaiah chapter 9. Verses 1 through 7. And if you're able to stand for the reading of God's Word, please. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee, the nations, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. <coughs> On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nations and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. 
and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness and the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. May God bless the reading of his word to your soul. May you see So I guess we're sort of beginning a new semi-series. We're, we're looking at the attributes of God. We're going to continue to do that, uh, Lord willing, over the next few weeks leading up to Christmas with looking at some passages in the <coughs> Scripture, particularly the Old Testament and other passages that just highlight some of the characteristics and attributes of Jesus that uh, we need to remember. We remember them in a special way at this time of season, time of year. In Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, is packed with them. Um, I was overwhelmed um, yesterday um, when I was here, uh, just kind of working on putting some finishing t touches on this a little bit and just looking at it, and we're just overwhelmed with uh, the beauty and the majesty in these verses in Isaiah, and then a whole bunch of other verses that I had like too many verses even to share, so some of them. Um, I won't share, but just the, the magnitude of uh, Jesus, celebrating the title, celebrating Jesus, our Messiah. Um, that's the central idea. He is the Messiah. Jesus is our Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah brings light. The Messiah brings joy. The Messiah brings his kingdom rule, which is seen in this prophecy of Isaiah. Lord, make it real to us. Amen. Lord, help us to see the light of the glory of your presence uh, this morning, that we would be changed by you. And we pray for any unsaved people, any not yet believers here or watching this later, Lord, that they would be touched with uh, the magnificence of who Jesus is and come to a saving relationship with him. In Jesus' name, amen. And so let me just say to those that watch this uh, video, well, it gets posted later on on YouTube. If you live in the area here, Middlebury, we're in Middlebury, Connecticut, 74 Kelly Road, Middlebury. Uh, please join us on any Sunday uh, at 11 o'clock. We social distance, we wear masks, we do temperature check. We have a huge, large space, um, and we're spread out, so it's a pretty safe environment as it, as it relates to the very safe environment as it relates to the pandemic, so you're welcome to um, come and visit us sometime where we celebrate the life of Jesus. Because he is the Messiah, we see that the Messiah brings light. Isaiah 9, chapter 9, verse 1. <laughs> I love, just, I just love, just the first phrase here. But there will be no more gloom. Amen. <laughs> That's true. Amen. <laughs> Okay, that's enough. Let me just stop right there. For her who was in anguish, there's no more gloom. There's no more anguish. There's no more despair. There's no more distress. There's no more anxiety. There's no more depre depression when the Messiah comes into uh, a person's life. He can change our life. And some of us deal with some of those things maybe more than others, and he'll help us to deal with those things as well. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun, in the land of Nephtali with contempt, but later on he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Amen. There will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. This goes back to uh, Isaiah chapter 8. Uh, look at Isaiah chapter 8, verse 22. Then they will look to the earth 
and behold, distress and darkness and gloom of anguish, and they'll be driven away into the darkness. So you all know from many Bible studies and sermons that you've heard on Isaiah chapter 9 that this is a prophecy as it relates to the Messiah. And um, it's also speaking of what would happen, or what happened to Israel uh, when they were in Babylonian or when they would go into captivity in Babylon. And so he's describing that, and then he's describing the hope that they'll come when they're delivered from that 70 years later. And then this is the prophecy of the coming of Messiah when all this will be done away with. There'll be no more gloom for who who is in anguish. That word gloom means darkness. The Messiah brings light. It means dimness. The idea here is darkness and gloom are all around, but it will not last forever. <laughs> and despite the fact that Israel rejected God's word, spoken here through the prophet Isaiah, God had planned to give the people his light again. For her who were in anguish, for her who were in distress. This refers to like the external pressure that comes on a person, a time of deep darkness, anguish, and gloom. And this was because of the Assyrian invasion, this is because of them being brought into captivity in Babylon, and the Messiah is on the other side of this, the Messiah will come. But the prophet speaks of a time where darkness, gloom, and anguish will be lifted. So there's an application right there that I didn't, make an, didn't really make an application point, but there it is right there that Jesus turns things around, right? Sometimes we're in the midst of darkness, we're in the midst of despair. It doesn't stay that way for us as a child of God who have the hope of Christ, who have the hope of the resurrection. In Jesus, our Messiah brings light. We find hope, deliverance. Isaiah says, in earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. Zebulun and Naphtali are two tribes of the northern Israel that suffered greatly when the Assyrian king, and I didn't look up the pronunciation of his name this morning, I should have done that again, King Tilgalath Poliezer III, when he attacked in 734 and 732 BC. But look what it says here in this verse. You talk about changing and turning things around. But later, he shall make it a glorious way by the way of the sea, on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So this prophecy here was actually fulfilled when Jesus lived and ministered in Capernaum near the highway from Egypt to Damascus called the Way of the Sea. The invading Assyrian army took that route when they invaded the northern kingdom. And from that area, Jesus came and Jesus would come and wipe away the gloom and darkness. Jesus came... So Jesus, here's application before we get to application. Jesus came to wipe away all gloom, all darkness of sin. Therefore, repent. Let me read Matthew chapter 9, verses 13 through 17. Or Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. I'll read the wrong verse. That was chapter 3. Chapter 4. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet that we just read. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee, the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven as it is at hand. So you see that, that Jesus turns things around. It was a time of gloom, it was a time of darkness, a time of anguish, but it wouldn't stay that way. They had to wait 70 years. And they had glory to cut short that time, it would have been longer. But Jesus turns things around. Don't you love that? Don't you love that part in that verse? Look at that with me, where it says, uh, the Maybe the second or third part of verse 1. But later on, so wait, so you got, there'll be no more gloom, there'll be no more anguish. There's gloom and anguish right now. Maybe there's gloom and anguish right now in your life, in my life, there's things that we're dealing with, right? But later on, he will make it glorious. Even that gloom and that darkness, he will make glorious. 
with the light of his presence because the Messiah brings light. Even if we're walking in the midst of gloom and darkness, he can bring the light of his presence. We could be walking in the light in the, dark, in the darkness and he could remove the darkness at the same time. I love that, but later shall make it glorious. I, I, you need to put that on your brain, brothers and sisters. That needs to become like a default of ours more and more. When we're in the whatever, we can say to ourselves, but later on, he will make it glorious. Later on, he will make it glorious. The gloom, the darkness, the despair, he will make it glorious. We ought to be, but he shall make it glorious. But he shall make it glorious kind of people. That's what he does in our lives. How often do we necessarily walk around even in the gloom and darkness of the moment and it's not always as gloomy and dark as we sometimes may think it is. It's the world of flesh and the devil that, that uh, helped to make it even look darker. It's never as dark as we may think it is. Also, we need to remember that Jesus turns things around. So that was the application before we get to application. Verse 2, remember in here, the Messiah brings light. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. That's why it was so good in the prelude there, John was playing. Arise, shine, for the light has come. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. So the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus is synonymous with the coming of light. Jesus, our Messiah, came to remove the captivity of darkness in our lives, the captivity and darkness of sin. And when the prophet Isaiah wrote this, they had not yet seen the light, but its occurrence was so certain and so vivid in the prophet's mind that he describes it as if it had already dawned. The captivity of Babylon would bring great calamity. And God promised to lighten the calamity as difficult as that would, would be for 70 years. Jeremiah 25, verses 8 through 11. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, God used that king, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all these nations around them, and I will utterly destroy them, and I will make a horror and a hissing as an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will take away from them the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, and the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, and the sound of millstones, and the light of a lamp. This is God's judgment here. This whole land will be a desolation and a horror. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So that's the situation there that was going to be turned around as the Messiah would come and bring light. So in the prophecy here of the Messiah's birth, we see the Messiah brings light. And we'll talk about that again in our application. And look what else the Messiah brings. Joy. Joy. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. You shall multiply, verse 3, you shall multiply the nation, you shall increase their gladness. <laughs> I like that too. Uh, we could be a people where the gladness, our gladness increases because the Messiah brings joy. We could be a people, look at verse 3, this is what it says in Psalm 16, verse 11. Um, they will be glad in your presence, as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the soil, the spoil. The word joy here is frequently emphasized in Isaiah, it's mentioned about two dozen times in the book. And you see it, Jesus, we know this, Jesus is, that was one thing about our dear, beloved brother, Steve Woodward. Just talking about joy here right now, that's what makes me think of Steve Woodward. Because he was the kind of person, he was like, no matter what was going on, he, we talk about the joy of Jesus. Amen. And having the joy of Jesus in his life as Messiah. And I even remember at the end, visiting him a couple times in the convalescent home, and it was like that joy was, was, was still there with him. The joy of Jesus. Jesus is the great joy giver. And you see where the relationship is between uh, 
joy and gladness. The joy and gladness comes from His presence. He can make His people glad in His presence. Wow. He can make His people glad in His presence. Do you know what it's like to experience the joy of His presence? There's great reason for rejoicing because God brings about a mighty deliverance. The deliverance that's pictured here, the deliverance from the sin and darkness in our life and the despair in our life and the deliverance from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and one day delivered from the presence of sin. Isaiah 35 verse 8 says, a highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. That's the narrow road. The highway of holiness. That's a narrow road. And the highway of holiness, that narrow road, is the road of joy. The broad way, the broad road, that's the way of despair. That's the way of the, the broad, the narrow road. You want to walk on the narrow road. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want to walk on that narrow road. That's the pathway to joy. That's the pathway to happiness. That's the pathway to peace. People, the unsaved people, not yet believers in our midst, those that you go to school with that are unsaved, those that you work with, those that live in your house that are unsaved, they're on the broad road, and that's the pathway of unhappiness, because their happiness, right, is totally linked to the last nice good thing that happened to them, right? The last moment of some way that their self was satisfied, that their self was fulfilled, and their happiness and their joy is so fragile because it depends on that. They're on the broad road. That narrow road is that way that leads to joy. It's called the highway of holiness there. The unclean will not travel on it. They don't want to go on that road. They don't want any part of that road. But it will be for him who walks that way and fools will not wander on it. Fool says in their heart there is no God, right? Verse 9 says, No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go upon it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed, they'll walk there. That's so cool. And the ransom of the Lord will return and come with joyful, shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. This is what we're celebrating here at Christmas, the Messiah bringing joy the Messiah bringing joy into our lives. It says he will break the yoke of their burden. There in verse 4. The oppressor, of the, the rod of their oppressor as in the battle of Midian. Verse 5. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle of Tumulant and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. For you shall break the yoke. That's another message there of uh, the Messiah. Breaking the yoke of the burden. Breaking the, of the, the, breaking the yoke of the burden of sin. That's why he says, come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. You want everlasting joy. You want everlasting peace. You want everlasting hope. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. Heary, weary and heavy laden over what? Weary and heavy laden over living without Christ. Weary and heavy laden over dealing with the world, the flesh of the devil. Weary and heavily laid in dealing with just your own stinking sin and the, and, the, and, the, and the power that that has over your life and the penalty that it has over your head. Come to me, O you are weary, heavy laid, and I will give you rest. The burdens there refers to that heavy load, this yoke, like an oxen, and the oppression taken away here. The current oppressor was the Assyrian army, but in a deeper sense, it was the bondage of that sin and their disobedience that brought them to it. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 4 through 7. That you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon and say, How the oppressor has ceased, and how fury has ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers, which used to strike the peoples in fury with unceasing strokes, which subdued the nations in anger with unrestrained persecution, and the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into shouts of joy. The Messiah brings light. The Messiah brings joy. 
In Jesus the Messiah, he brings his kingdom rule. Where is his kingdom rule? The kingdom of heaven is within you. Those who have been saved, those who have been born again, those who have a living hope. Look at verse 6. Don't you love verse 6? For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. For to us, I, I, don't you just love this there, for a child will be born to us. What does Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 say? For when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. And then we got one of these purpose statements. For what purpose was he born under a woman? For what purpose was he born under the law? So that he might redeem those who live under the law or under the law, that he might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of the Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then, then an heir through God. Don't you love those words, to us? Where would we be without that, to us? For unto us, a child has been born. A son has been given. And the government... Oh, that will be a good day. When the government will rest on his shoulders. And, and just look at, I mean, these words were written 600 years before the birth of Christ. And the words also look forward to the time when Christ will return with his kingdom rule, like it says in the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, and the Lord will be king over all the earth in that day. The Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. It's like Isaiah saying here, behold your king. Behold your king. <clears throat> and his name will be called. Just got to think about these, the names here. Think about his attributes. Thinking about his characteristics. Thinking about how we need him as our wonderful counselor. Right? All the verses in John chapter 14, 15, 16 that speak of how he was going to send the Holy Spirit to be our comforter to be our counselor, to be our helper. Well, Jesus is that. And we, you and I need to learn how to go to him as that. Our wonderful counselor in the midst of the situations that we deal with in life. And the comfort of the presence of his Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit? Gene, the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ living inside of you. Wow. That's awesome. Well, what? What's the Holy Spirit, Joe? Jesus, the presence of Jesus Christ dwelling in you. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Amen. In this world you have trials, you have tribulation, you have trouble. But in me you will have peace. Peace. Let's say in John 16, that was like, quote John 16, 33. These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Sometimes we have to say that to ourselves. He who has overcome the world and is enjoying me. I need to run to him as my wonderful counselor. Jesus is our mighty God. Oh, so what's impossible with God? Not Nothing God. is impossible with God. Come on, get a grip, right? Nothing is impossible with God. In fact, it's just the opposite. He does the impossible. He is our mighty God. So you're in the midst of something and you've got to go to Him as your mighty God. He will uphold you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will help you. I will uphold you, Isaiah 41.10, with my righteous right hand. And I like to say, Gene, go like this. Put your right arm out. Go like, Gene, put your right arm out. Put your right hand up. So your arm is shorter than mine. So... When it says, fear not, I am with you, be it me, he will uphold you with his righteous right hand, he'll uphold you quicker and faster than he'll uphold me. I got a further distance to go, so to speak. So to speak. But you get the point, right? He's our mighty God. Amen. Provides victory over life's injustices, too. Okay? One day. 
All the injustices that happen might not get corrected right now, today, in your lifetime and in my lifetime, but one day they will. Amen. And oftentimes we face things that don't make sense. But God is a God of justice. In His timing, He will make things right. And He's not like the unjust judge, right? The widow had to beg on him just so he, you know, he wouldn't be troubled anymore. He gave her what our God is not like. Our God is ready, willing, and wanting to help us and meet the needs and the concerns of His people. So He's our wonderful counselor. He's our mighty God. He's our eternal Father. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He sees the beginning from the end. He knows all the points in between. And being, his, being our eternal Father, we know where our eternal destiny at the end of this life ends in the joy of His presence. And the Prince of Peace. <laughs> I mean, you could take any one of these, you could take, and I've done it before probably, right? Take Isaiah 9, 6, and just bask in the glory of these attributes and truths of who he is. He is the Prince of Peace. He gives peace with God and he gives the peace of God. He provides us the peace of his presence. So let's keep applying this. He's the Messiah. Because he's the Messiah, he brings light. Think about how he needs to bring the light of his presence into your life and my life this morning. He brings joy. Think about how he needs to bring the light, how he can bring the light, how he can bring the joy of his presence into your life today. And Really, it all kind of wraps around what we're just saying here. He brings his kingdom rule. For us to experience his joy, his light, his peace, everything of who he is, we have to be able, we have to surrender and submit ourselves to his kingdom rule in our lives, surrender to him as our Lord and Savior. That's why it was good the verses that Cheryl read earlier when we read the, did the, the reading there. For this reason, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is at every book, every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow. They will. And the invitation is to bow the knee to him now. Bow the knee to him today. But what presents, prevents the person from bowing their knee in submission to Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, what, what prevents that is their pride. One day, I don't want to say it this way, but, you know, when a person is standing there in judgment before God, they will bow their knee at that point and say, Jesus, you are Lord. And that's when he'll say to those that are on his, depart from me, I never knew you. <laughs> it's too late at that point. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I liked how this banner... I like sort of like a 3D thing you got going here. I, mean, I know that was probably very much so intentional. You got these two new beautiful banners right here, right? Jesus is saved. These are brand new, right? These two? Yes. Is born. He is the Prince of Peace. But you got the glory is up front. That I'm sure was I'm sure that was done on purpose. The glory is up front. His glory. The glory of his presence. Amen. Oh, amen. All right, so what ways do we need the light that only Jesus can provide? i got to go to the other Bible here because I've got so many different other verses. But we'll just read them. John chapter 12, verse 46. I have come into the world as a light so that the one who believes in me, so that no one who believes in me should stay in the darkness. It's like the light has come into the world, as it says there in John chapter 3. And men and women, people love the darkness, and so they stayed in the darkness. They stayed in the darkness of their sin. They stayed in their hiding places. They stayed in the quiet of their, I don't know, illustration. They're in their room in the quiet, in the dark, with just a computer screen or their phone. And they're doing things that they know that they shouldn't be doing because they think no one's going to see it. They quit. Turn it off. Or you ever do that if you're doing something and you know you shouldn't be doing it? It's like, oh, okay, they didn't, they didn't see that. But God sees it, right? And they don't want to come, to, the unsaved person doesn't want to come into the light of the presence of the glory of God. He says, I've come as a light of the world so that the one who believes in me should not stay in the darkness. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 that I read last week, but it bears reading again right here in the context of this light. The God of this age has blinded the mind of the unbelievers. And what are they blinded with? The world, the flesh, the devil, their self. They're blinded mostly with their self and with their flesh and their love affair with themselves. Blinded that they can't see the light of the glory of God, of the glory of Christ until he removes that veil. It says they cannot see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. God has to remove that veil. God has to remove that darkness. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He calls us out of the darkness as his children into his marvelous light. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. He who follows me won't walk in the darkness of sin, but will have the light of life. In what ways do we need the light that only Jesus can provide? In what ways do we need the joy that only Jesus can provide? Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all people. For today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, who is Christ the Lord. What ways do people need the joy that only Jesus can provide, the joy of salvation that only Jesus can give? You know, in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, he says, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. You think about that's a good illustration. That's Isaiah 12, 3. The person who is uh, unsaved, and then they come, the veil has been taken away from their eyes, and they see the light of the glory of Christ, and now they are thirsty for salvation, thirsty for forgiveness, and they go and they draw from the well of salvation with joy, there it says, um, with joy. Drawing from the wells of salvation with joy. I like Isaiah 61, verse 10, too, as it relates to uh, this joy that Isaiah um, speaks about. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he's clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Isn't that a wonderful picture there when God clothes a person with the robe of righteousness, gives him, gives a person Christ's righteousness, and clothes them with that righteousness and the joy that that brings. John chapter 15, verse 11, one more, we think about this joy that only Jesus gives and the joy that only Jesus can bring. I've always loved this verse, John chapter 15, verse 11. worth waiting for. Here it comes. The vine and the branches, he abides in me and bears much fruit. Then he says, I told you this, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. The joy of Jesus. The joy that Jesus gives. So in what way do we need that joy? In what way do we need to surrender to Jesus' kingdom rule over our lives? This is where Sammy, Esther, and Kenny Listen to this verse. It speaks about Jesus and the kingdom. And Jesus got a little child and had them stand among them and said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. That childlike, humble faith. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
So the picture there, the surrendering to Jesus. Surrendering to Jesus is kingdom rule over our lives. The humility that is needed uh, for us to do that. Then in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So what time is it, unbeliever? What time is it, not yet, saved person? It is... Um, the kingdom of heaven is near. It's time to repent. It's time to turn to Jesus Christ for salvation and forgiveness of sin. Let me just read two other little verses here as it relates to application. Do you have, talk about peace, do you have peace with God? Romans chapter 5, verse 1 is a wonderful verse that speaks about the peace of God. Peace with God. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God comes when our sins are reconciled through Christ's cross and we turn to Him in repentance and faith to be saved. And somebody gave me this verse also last week after the sermon, speaking about the peace of God, Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So through Christ we have peace with God. Through Christ we have the peace of God. Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah brings light. The Messiah brings joy. The Messiah brings his kingdom rule. The foundational question could be, in what ways do I need, do we need the Messiah to affect our lives this morning? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, as we're closing here, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine upon them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. So God can give us that light. God can give us that joy. God can turn that darkness into despair and gloom. He can turn the situations in our lives around. We need to run and cling to Jesus, our Messiah. How does all this happen? Verse 7, the last verse. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. How will all this happen? How will the Messiah bring light? How will the Messiah bring joy? How will the Messiah bring his kingdom rule? How, what, how can this child be born to us? How can this son be given to us? How can he be our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our eternal father, our prince of peace? It says the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. It is the Lord God, the zeal of the Lord that will accomplish this in our hearts and in our lives if we would but only turn to Him in repentance and faith and that cling to Him. Amen. So Lord, thank You. Thank You for uh, the Messiah. Thank You for the celebration that we could have of the Messiah bringing light and joy and His kingdom rule. And Lord, right now, if there be somebody here and you've touched their heart and the light of the glory of Christ has shown on their life. It's like that prelude that Jonah prayed, arise, shine, for the light has come. But if there be someone here who knows they're walking around in darkness and they see Jesus, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There's somebody here and God's touched your heart and you need that light and you need that life and you need that joy and you need that kingdom rule that only Jesus can give. I ask you to come forward, stand right here alongside uh, the communion table. And Brother John will meet anybody if they come forward here and talk with them and pray with them as it relates to their need for Christ. And for us as children of God, as children of the light, help us to, to run to the light. Help us to enjoy the, joy, the, the peace that you bring 
in your presence in an ever-increasing reign. And Lord, may your kingdom come and your will and your rule be done in our lives in greater measure. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.